Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see um, folks here in uh, Becton Dickinson and a, a, a robust crowd online. It's great to see everybody. Um, uh, before I forget, um, when it comes to um, the chance to ask questions, please, um, those of you online, uh, type your question in, and Becky is going to be um, checking the, uh, uh, the line, and, and we'll call on you for your questions. So keep, uh, keep that in mind. So just over a century ago, I'm going to take you back a century. In the year 1919, a Belgian scientist named Jules Bourdais was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work in immunology. He was particularly known for his study of the complement system, a group of proteins that help us fight infections, heal injuries, and kill bacteria and viruses. For the past 100 years, scientists have built on that work, growing our understanding of the vital role that the complement system plays in both health and disease. And just this year, here at the Bloomberg School in the lab of Fen Yi Wan, our knowledge grew even further. In 2014, Fen Yi and his colleagues uncovered through a study with mice a previously unknown benefit of breast milk. Their experiments suggest that complement proteins in breast milk boost mouse infant health by directly eliminated some types of gut-dwelling bacteria. This reshaping of the gut microbiota protects the young from certain infectious threats. Now, to put all that very simply, this finding expands our understanding of the protective power of breast milk. It opens the door for epidemiologists as well as pediatricians to conduct more studies and harness this new knowledge for greater impact. And just as exciting, this study also appears to have to be an advance in the very basic um, science of immunology. Those complement proteins celebrated a century ago with the Nobel Prize are typically thought to work in partnership with antibodies. But Fen Yi and his team have shown that this breast milk activity is a little bit different. It acts against bacteria without antibodies. Now, in just a moment, Fen Yi will tell us much, much more about this science and what it means and where his discovery can take us. And I'm thrilled he's here to present today's Dean's Lecture. As many of you know, I think most of you know, uh, that the Dean's Lecture series is an opportunity for us to hear from our full professors, our newly promoted or appointed uh, professors, as well as our senior scientists. And I always look forward to these events to learn firsthand from cutting edge thinkers like Fen Yi. Fen Yi earned a PhD in biophysics from the Chinese Academy of Sciences in 2003. And then the following year, he came to the United States as a research fellow at NIH. He joined Johns Hopkins in 2016 and is a professor in our Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology with a joint appointment in both MMI as well as the School of Medicine. In his lab, he is working to answer basic biological questions that could have a profound impact on human health. He's particularly focused on the interactions between host cells, microbiota, and pathogens in order to better understand health and disease uh, in the colon. And with rates of colon cancer continuing to rise all around the globe, this work is more important than ever before. Over the past eight years at Johns Hopkins, Fen Yi has conducted exciting and highly collaborative research. He's earned numerous awards, just to name a few. He's uh, received the Johns Hopkins Catalyst Award, an Idea Development Award from the Department of Defense, and the Shikani El Hebri Prize for discovery in, in, and innovation. And this is just to name a few. He is also committed to uh, education and graduate education and beyond graduate education. He has received excellence in teaching awards and excels as a mentor, having worked with master's students, PhDs, and postdoctoral fellows, as well as students from the Lawrence Dunbar High School. His department chair, Ashani, will tell you that Fen Yi is deeply invested in the success of the department, the school, as well as the university. Fen Yi is also highly sought after 
uh, for his expertise beyond Johns Hopkins, serving as a study section reviewer, reviewer for NIH and lecturing at national and international conferences. Now, if I continue to talk about Fenny and all his honors and appointments, we'll be here all day. So let me just say that we're so grateful for, to, to have Fen Yi on our, um, uh, on our faculty for his hard work and for the incredible impact he's making um, for our school and in the field. The curiosity and excitement that he brings to the lab is reflected in, his, in the amazing output of discoveries. Today's lecture is going to be a very great reminder of the power of basic sciences and how important they are to our core mission of protecting health and saving lives. We're just thrilled to have Dr. Wan here uh, today for this uh, special Dean's Lecture. Ben Yi. Thanks very much for uh, Dean McKenzie's nice introduction and uh, really my uh, great pleasure and great honor to uh, summarize all the studies that in the past uh, uh, 13 years in my laboratory here. And I really appreciate uh, Pierre who was originally recruited me to Johns Hopkins and I should definitely put me in promotion. Otherwise I won't be college uh, eligible uh, to uh, present this. So just like a brief introduction about my laboratory, and so we focus on the gut. So uh, in the lab, we are interested about um, host pathogen and uh, microbiota infection. So we use a mouse infection model, specifically using Citrobacter odentium, and which is uh, gram-negative bacteria, which is a murine equivalent of a human pathogen, EPAC and EHAC. So it's very important to study the diarrhea disease in the developing country. But expanding from this host and pathogen infection, now we're studying what is the host and what is the key virulence that's related with the lethal infection in the immunocompromised population, like a kids and a, like a, a irradiated patients and adults and so on and so forth. So we expand to the infections. Uh, with microbiota, with the power of the germ-free facility, which locates in this, this building. So in the past, I really appreciate all the funding engines that we support our research and during over these years and from the school, from the university, from the uh, NIH, DOD, as well as private foundations. So you can see the directions are pretty diverse, so uh, which indicates in our laboratory it's very the direction is also very diverse. And, and from here, I also would like to thank all the collaborators, and most of them are in the audience. And through the years, as you guys are very nice to share a reengine, to share resource, and to share your expertise. So I really want to take this great advantage to thank you all for your help, encouragement, and the collegial interactions from my heart and from my gut. <laughs> and most likely, this is also a very great opportunity for me to formally appreciate all the trainees in the past uh, that was in my laboratory, from high school students to uh, rotation students to uh, PhD students at CM and the postdoc and the clinical fellows and the visiting professors. So it's really a great opportunity to work with you guys, and I really appreciate you guys got to join a not established lab from the beginning and uh, trust uh, this captain to rush through all these different directions I just mentioned. So, um, so obviously, uh, sometimes the boat is flipped. But in most case, I really appreciate the moments that we work together as a team. And some of our hypotheses truly uh, turns out to be correct. Then we have safely landed into some area that we can see nicely view and peacefully. So we get a publication, just give you a few examples. This is some of our highly achievement and during the past years. And if to have the chance, I really want to have the opportunity to work again with you guys and just to go through all these like different directions. So thank you. 
So as I mentioned, my lab focusing on the gut. So then from the beginning of the, of the life, so what is the stuff that's leading to fill in this gut to make its development? So that's leading to uh, the breast milding, uh, breastfeeding. So the human being has a long history and a very, very rich culture about breastfeeding. So just by uh, simple Googling, then you can nicely find this breastfeeding related artists from the history and you can see the painting from Netherlands and you can see the World War II poster style in the United States. So nowadays and people has been uh, increasingly appreciate and breastfeeding and very important for the maternal as well as the infantile health. So um, therefore it's very important to understand what is a component in this magic job. So this picture I just simply took from uh, by Googling and uh, I, I mean to do that on purpose as I want to know what is the public awareness of the stuff that's in the breast milk. So I noticed the, um, the knowledge is also evolving through people's increasing understanding this. So clearly we know they have a water, they have a proteins, they have a lactose, they have a hormone growth factors and they have antibodies, they have antibiotics, and so on and so forth. So they have tons of uh, bacteria strains, they have uh, vitamins, they have uh, different micronutrients, and so on and so forth. So, but one thing that's existed in milk for years through evolution, but people don't know what's the function, even immunologists may not that familiar with what's the function of complement proteins in breast milk. But we do been documented for more than 50 years that breast milk contains complement protein. So what's complement protein? Thanks for Dean's nice introduction. So this is 1990 Nobel Prize to a Belgium scientist, Jules Bohade, and for the discovery of complement, which is a complement to antibody. We know antibody is very important. So this is during um, the immune system, how they protect, protect us from attacks by a bacterial infection through a serum, through in the, in the, in the blood. So they, his discovery basically find they have a two different components. One is antibody. The other, the antibody is formed by immunization against specific bacteria. So just pay attention, this is immunized antibody, as well as another component called complement protein, which is existing in blood that is not immunized. So antibody and complement protein need to work together to recognize a specific bacterial and leading to the lysis. So that's leading to the discovery of the signal pathway that's leading to complement activation. So because this original finding, this is also terminized as a classical pathway, which basically depends on the antibody and the complement infection that's leading to the cascade, prote protease cascades and leading to the downstream protease activation and uh, sequentially leading to this activation. So after 50 years discovery of classical pathway, an alternative pathway has been discovered and which basically is not depends on antibody. It can through additional protein protein action directly leading to the downstream uh, C3 activation. And after another 40 years and lactin, which is also recognized as a third pathway that's can directly leading to uh, the complement activation. So the reason the complement, so I will go through details of this at later and the sequential events and all this, but then the reason for complement had less understood is because it's so complex. It's, it involves more than 50 proteins, which, in, which involve in both activation as well as inhibitory. So therefore very difficult to uh, study this. Then the work, that, that's I'm going to share with you, starting uh, with a very, very uh, unexpected results coming from uh, the postdoc, Dr. Dong Jingxu in the laboratory. So as I mentioned, we studying host-dependent microbiota infection. So we 
are very interested about what is the different genetics manipulation mice, how they respond to citrobacter challenge. If they are very sensitive, so that's we are excited about that results. So Dongjin came back with a very, very um, unusual experiments results that basically show if you're using complement deficient mice, if you're using baby mice, 21 days, it's very sensitive to citrobacter infection. But if you're using adult mice after eight weeks, five to eight weeks or after, it's not a sensitive anymore. So very, very uh, interesting phenotype, which cannot simply explain by, oh, this is just like immunocompromised. So that's leading us to very carefully study this. And so his original data came in from C1QC knockout mice, which is the complex of C1. So we want to know whether this is complement dependent or this is a totally complement independent function. So we want to see what is downstream, whether they phenocopy the same phenotype. So um, the C3 is in the center of these three pathways. So we want to use in C3 knockout. So greatly uh, our colleagues, uh, Stefan Lajon on the sixth floor of this building have C3 knockout mice so uh, nicely and sh he shared that with us. And so we can confirm our phenotype very easily. So here's the data you can see. Um, we basically uh, breed the mice separately and wait until the pups until 21 before they are weaned from their uh, dams and then we give them citrobacter infection. Without citrobacter infection, these mice look apparently normal. There's no any apparent phenotype, there's no gross defect, no anything. But after infection, the white type mice will still keep going, growing. So that's as reported in most of um, literature that um, citrobacter infection is a non-invasive, is self-limiting infection. So the immune system, even just like a developing baby pops, is enough to uh, clear this infection. However, the complement deficient mice, both C1 and C3 knockout, show very, very dramatic retardation in growth, and these mice die after a one, within one to two weeks after infection. So very sensitive. And to make sure this is have citrobacter infection, we do have further characterization. Here I just simply show you guys, if you open the mice, you can see very clearly swollen and the shortening of their colon. And also historically will tell you that they are dramatically uh, have immune infiltration and so on and so forth. So when Dongqin did experiments using the same cohort, but just wait to mice, and grow until uh, eight weeks to reach their adulthood, then the phenotype is dramatically different. Then they, similar as their white type equivalent, they barely lost their body weight and all the mice survival survived after this uh, citrobacter challenge. So that's leading us to revisit, look at our data. So 21 days pops is very sensitive to citrobacter infection. So obviously, white uh, complement sufficient mice and complement deficient mice, they are different in their genotype because one is knockout, one is white type. But we also notice before you do infection, all these pups has to suck milk from different dams. So therefore, this is this pups was nursed by a white by the dams provide a white type milk but this is provided by uh, complement deficient milk. So this just give you illustrate that this day one pops that which just like suck the milk. So this is normally called the milk spot. So therefore we realize this could be the, there could be two variables. One is genetics, the other is the milk. So don't you did experiments. So basically synchronize the breeding and do cross fostering. So then uh, the, the knockout will have a litter. Then you can split half to be nursed by the original um, complement deficient dams, but the, the rest you can give that to a white type dams. So in that way, their genotype is the same. Then they just receive different milk. So then after 21 days, and the body weights of these pups is comparable. 
So there's no obvious phenotype. So after challenging, then you can clearly see that the pups receive wild type milk and survive the citrobacter challenging. Well, the pups receive the complement deficient milk will be very susceptible to the citrobacter infection. So reversely, we did a reverse experiment. So we put in wild type pups under the uh, complement deficient dams. So in that way, we wait until 21 days, and then we basically did the same challenging, and then we basically see similar phenotype. Even wild type pups, if they are nursed by complement deficient dams, then it will be more sensitive to, to citrobacter infection, while the wild type dams will be totally fine. So uh, this, so look at this data. So look at this data. And Dong Qing and another PhD student, Liu Yue, in the laboratory, so they have more critical to say. And so just look at this as an example. These two pups' genotype is the same. These two pups receive different milk. But then during the time, this 21 days period, and they were exposed to different cage. They were diff exposed to different mom. So how about the mom already brings some environmental factor that contribute to this phenotype? So they have designed a very, very elegant and um, experimental design that's basically combined the cross fostering together with these co-housing experiments that's used in the microbi microbiota study. So uh, the breeding strategy coming from uh, hats and hats complement mice. So therefore, you will generate the same litter, uh, Y type and the knockout from the same liter, so which will be viewed as the closest microbiota. So then from this, we have a male mice co-housing together, we have female mice co-housing together, and they have a different genotype. And then we mate them, and so therefore, and after mating, then we're putting all these pregnant females in the same cage, co-housing. So therefore, all these females will experience the same environmental uh, condition. So then we studying the cross forcing experiments. So we split half of them to be exclusively uh, nursed by white type dams, and the other half exclusively be nursed by um, complement deficient dams. And over the and we put in the rest white type and complement deficient dams together within a house, within the same a co-housing cage. So in that way, they have similar environment. So after 24 hours, we basically switch this different mom. And then so therefore back and forth. So make ensure that the pups has been exposed to the most the close, the closest uh, environmental uh, factors. So after that, then wait until these pups grow until 21 days, then we give them infection we basically can see similar results. So that's indicate um, the environmental factor is not that critical. The pops genotype is not that critical. The milk is very important. The milk from different dam is very, very important. So to approve that this, um, the microbiota is very important. So uh, we work with Hua Ding on the third floor germ-free facility. So we derived the C1QC uh, SPF mice to germ-free. So we basically generate germ-free mice and using those as a control, we do citrobacter infection. So under this condition, and because it's germ-free, so there's no commensal, so all the citrobacter colonized similarly in this Y type and the C1 knockout germ-free mice. But then, over time, then you can see even com complement deficient germ-free mice, they grow as comparable as white type citrobacter, and all these mice happily survive 21 days. So that's indicate citrobacter is alone is not sufficient to provide the virulence and causing this animal to die. And compare this data with specific pathogen free, that's indicated microbiota is very, very important. So to do that, then we do fecal transplant. If in this germ-free C1 knockout mice, 
if we gave them Y type as, as Y type POPs microbiota to see whether they will be sensitive to Citrobacter infection. And all, in the meanwhile, we can also give them a C1 microbiota. So this basically experiment did was when the specific pathogen free POPs, which grow until 17 days, which will contain microbiota. So we utilize the POPs and get the microbiota and inoculate that into germ-free POPs. Wait until they colonize, and then we give them challenge. So in that way, we can put in Y-type microbiota and complement deficient POPs microbiota. So the results shows that if you give Y-type POPs microbiota, the mice survive. If you give complement deficient microbiota, in germ-free mice, these mice turns out to be very sensitive. So that's an indicate microbiota is very, very important. So then our question goes to, before we do citrobacter infection, after 21 days, this pops was nursed by different milk. What is the microbiota in their gut? So we collaborate with uh, Jian Yang and uh, Zhou Siyu at the Chinese Academy of Medical Science in Beijing. So we did a uh, microbiota analysis. So we basically getting all this um, CECO and the colon contacts and we do 16A sequencing and then to see what's the uh, results. So it turns out that the POPs, Y type C1 knockout and C3 knockout POPs, their microbiota has a dramatic difference. Although they didn't show any uh, difference in um, apparent phenotype without challenging, but then they do have a microbiota difference. So they don't have big change on the species number, but they have a dramatic different distribution of these different levels. So uh, therefore, it's very, very uh, interesting confirm our phenotype that is the microbiota is different. So what can cause in what can cause in uh, this what can cause in this pops microbiota difference? So one way is we provide breast milk. This was was nursed by breast milk. So breast milk itself is a culture is a culture media for the microbiota bacteria. So could be whether the quality of this different milk, the, the, the nutrient is different. So that's definitely will lead into different population growth is different. So uh, therefore we want to study what is the macronutrients as well as micronutrients in the, in the, in the uh, mouse breast milk. So this is apparent look that if you get milk from Y type and C3 and the C1 knockout dams, so they are looks comparable and they have a rich in protein and so on and so forth. So we basically drop these samples at a national zoo in Washington DC and using their facility to measure the macro uh, nutrients in this mice, in this um, uh, mouse breast milk samples. And we basically found out all the macronutrients is comparable. So uh, dry mat, water, protein, fat, and so on and so forth. So this is consistent with if we do cross cross force experiments, all the pubs nursing by different dams, their body weight is comparable. So that indicate this complement knockout is not to have a general uh, nutrient defect in this breast milk. So then whether they influence the end, then uh, Dongqing basically uh, put in PBS and to look at a soluble fraction we call whey of this breast milk. So they contains lipids on the top, similar as a human breast milk, and they have a casing on the bottom. And in the middle layer is the whey, which is a, so which is a solution, protein solution, contains all kinds of factors and proteins. So we measure the antibody within this way is comparable. And so therefore this cannot explain why the microbiota is different. So therefore uh, we did a very, very bulk hypothesis as whether this complement can directly lyse bacteria. So we did classical microbiology experiments. So uh, this is the C1 knockout paths nursed by C1 dams. So wait until 21 days where you know they're sensitive to citrobacter infection, we know their microbiota is different with Y-type. So the hypothesis would be 
If complement in the breast milk will lyse or kill certain bacteria, then we might be able to recapitalize that in vitro. So basically, we used rhizomyce and took out the cecum and uh, uh, colonic contacts. So we call that as a uh, commensal bacteria. We lay those on the agar plate, and then on top of that, we spot certain type of uh, breast milk whey. If this material contains bacterial cooling capability, it will suppress the growth of this uh, bacteria. So this is a classical uh, microbiology analysis. So uh, we're lucky we didn't do, uh, we just do anaerobic culture and then we can see very, very striking phenotype. So um, this is just, I mentioned, if you put in white type whey, breast milk on top of this, so it's certainly well suppressed bacterial growth. But if you put in complement deficient breast whey there, and then you will have less efficient to kill bacteria. So then what is left here, so we suspect that that could be what is the target for our complement. So we pick up multiple clones. They're all this very similar. We pick up multiple strains and do the sequencing, and they all are staphyl uh, locus, Atlantis B3. So um, we have whole genome sequencing. We compare this with the known Atlantis uh, genome at NCBI, so basically confirm that this is a gram-positive Atlantis bacteria. So this we isolated this. So if the idea is so this is the in vitro experiments. So show that the way in the complement have the capability to kill um, one of specific gram-positive bacteria in vitro, whether that's the case in vivo. If you assume that C3 complement deficient, they cannot kill this species, then supposedly in the microbiota, they should be high. So when we look back at 16S microbiota sequencing, I highlighted the staffel here, so you can see in the C1 and the C3 knockout mice, they do have relatively elevated levels compared to Y type control. So that indicates this could be, could be also happens that's in, in vivo. So then we isolate the pure culture, Atlantis B3, grow them in the, this is a sheep blood agar and basically showed very, very nice um, features, characteristic features that uh, as Staffel should show. And also, if you look at those under electro microscope, they are definitely gram positive uh, looking. And so now if we're using um, pure culture to do the similar experiments, then we get the same results if you put in Y type breast milk whey on top of it, it will kill bacteria. But if you put in C1 and C3 knockout, and it will be the effect of a way more dramatic attenuated. So, and not only just on the uh, agar plate culture, we can also see the similar results if we culture them in the liquid. So that's an indicate, and this is also uh, happens in the liquid culture, which is very important because this culture will lead us to do some biochemical analysis to further to look at what's going on during this whole procedure. So this shows very nicely like mice, uh, breast milk whey can have this capability. So how about a human? So uh, we, we getting um, human breast milk samples from mother's milk bank in California. So they sent us a bunch of this donated um, breast milk. So we basically did the in vitro experiments and to see whether this breast milk will have capability to kill Atlantis B3 that we isolated. So you can see more or less, they will have a capability to, um, to kill this bacteria. So here we just do CFU culture. So you cannot truly distinguish whether this is only suppressed bacterial growth or this is due to really cooling. So to address that, we did time uh, cooling assay. So this basically just like uh, during this incubation time, during different time, we basically get an alcohol from this assay 
and put them into a fresh media to check how many live bacteria are left there. If it's a surprise bacterial expression in this assay, then you should see bacteria should regrow on the LB or different uh, agar plate. But if it's killing, then because the bacteria are already dead, so you won't see anything. So through this time killing assay, we basically confirm that this is bacterial killing. This is not a suppression because we, at the later time course, we didn't see any bacteria there. So that's leading to very, very um, interesting phenotype. So then how this is going to kill bacteria? So this I use in Ma and the, and the colleagues, this very, very nice diagram and to zoom in the classical pathway. So this is depends on anybody and C1 and C3 and all this. So we, we show that in vitro and in vivo, that C1 and C3 dependent bacteria killing. So whether during our readout is bacteria killing. So then biochemically, whether C1, whether complete, whether complete pathway is really being activated. So we don't know. So to address that, then we basically to, if the complement is getting being activated, then this is a sequential protease activation procedure. You will see the cleave of the, the uh, protease from their precursor to activated form. So therefore, using human milk, then uh, because available of the tools, then we basically illustrate if you incubate uh, Atlantis B3 together with the human milk, over time, then you will see very clearly cleavage of C1S, which is basically the, uh, the classical marker, biochemical markers of a C1 complex activation. So that indicate they do active C1. So if they active C1 and whether they lead into all these sequential and very dynamic biochemical pathway, but the last point is they have a C5, B9, they have a big pore complex formation in the, back, in the membrane. So that is by principle. So then we did immunofluorescence staining with the, using specific antibody, which only recognize the newly formed C5B, to nine big whole complex, then we can illustrate that if you incubate it this way, then you are going to form this different um, of pore complex. If the pore complex form, it will influence the structure of the bacterial, so will leading to electrolyte uh, release, elect the change of the membrane uh, potential. So using membrane potential specific dye, we illustrate that over time, that's this way incubation while leading to very, very dramatic membrane potential uh, lost in the bacteria. So membrane potential is required for the energy to generate ATP. Without this, obvious demise, the, the bacteria is going to die. So this is all indirect evidence to suggest that, and it seems like the complement pathway happens here and leading to the poor complex formation. So whether we can illustrate the really poor complex formation. So uh, this Dong Qing did a very, very nice experiment using electron microscope to look at the membrane of the Atlantis B3 uh, membrane. So you can see very, very nicely, they form this 10 nanometer-ish and poor complex and have the, all these kinds of hole. If you put in a complement inhibitory protein in front of this C5B9 pore complex formation, you basically were able to block it. So that's an indicate it's truly form this big complex and then leading to the, the gram positive bacterial death. So uh, this is using human um, breath way and we can also using uh, mouse, the uh, mouse way from uh, different dams, Y type and C1, C3 knockout. So the mice dam definitely can show very similar pore complex formation, but if you're using uh, complement deficient, then they lost this capability, consistent with the levels that they cannot kill bacteria and, and their sensitivity. 
and so on and so forth. So now uh, we basically using genetics and the biochemical way to show that um, C1, comp C1 complex activation and the C5B9, the terminal uh, pore complex formation participating. So the question is whether antibody involves here. So whether antibody involves here, then using human way, we did antibody uh, depletion. So basically you put in a specific antibody to deplete the, uh, the IgG and IgM from, um, from the human breast milk. So this basically illustrates that we are pretty good at this depletion. So then after depletion, then we check further incubation with Atlantis whether they can cause in C1 activation. So it turns out the activation is comparable. So that's the indicate it's not through, uh, it's not through uh, the antibody. So then after C1 activation, whether they still form C1B9 complex. So this was illustrated by flow cytometry. And you can see the natural way and the IgG depleted way show comparable level. And if you look at them, them under microscope, and they all show very, very similar, the pore complex. So that's an indicate. If you delete antibody, then if they still have a capability, at least in vitro, they were able to active complement and to form this complex. So the experiment we did here is immunodepletion. So you might still, people can argue, you might still have a tiny chance, of tiny chance of amount of this uh, antibody that could participate in. So to really address that, we turn again to the genetics tools. That's, so how about if you're using the, the breast milk from uh, antibody deficient uh, dams? So that's one of those with mu MT knockout mice, which have no general uh, immunoglobin. So, um, and luckily, uh, Monica Munia on the third floor of this building who has mu MT knockout mice and nicely share with us. So we are using the milk from these different dams. And then, so first we confirm that this knockout is no IgG, IgM, so no antibody. And then we basically did a similar experiments and we can see comparable the MAC pore complex formation. So that indicate this is well able to uh, basically independent of antibody can cause in this cell membrane lysis. So we cross this mu MT knockout mice into C1. So, and if you, if you knock out a uh, complement at the background of this antibody knockout mice, you basically lost the capability. So therefore, again, at a different genetics background, we show that you need complement, but not antibody to active complement and to generate this big whole uh, complex. So um, therefore, to summarize all the data that I show you currently, uh, if you want to see the more details and which will come in from uh, our recent public paper in cell. So basically the key point is winning mice with complement deficient milk are very susceptible to uh, enteric infection, Citrobacter rodentium as an example. And complement in breast milk selectively eliminate certain bacterial, uh, gram-positive bacterial in the infant guts. And the breast milk complement is activated through a C1-dependent and antibody-independent pathway. So antibody-independent pathway. So that sounds challenging the current model. So because this is a 1991 Nobel Prize, this is the original discovery of the complement, which clearly say it's need to intact together with the antibody. And why in our hands we see this activation is totally independent of the antibody. So this is a big challenge of the dogma, but also a very, very fruitful discussion with a gentleman on the fifth floor and who is also in the audience. So I tried to convince him whether this could be possible. So um, therefore, I also go back to read hardly all the textbook about how we know about the complement. So 
The complement will be always discussed in the textbook, the second chapter, innate immunity, which is basically the non-specific immunity. It protects everything. And, but a very interesting, even on some review, people comment that the discovery is coming from adaptive immunity because from the antibody. So through the discussion with the elves, it turns out to be very interesting and fruitful and also give you an idea so how important is public health. So as it turns out, I just mentioned, this is a sequential biochemical pathway from protease activation, cleave the precursor and to downstream and active the downstream protease and cleave the precursor and so on and so forth. It turns out this model was provided by a gentleman and who uh, named is Manfred uh, Mayer, and who used to be working at a school of public health from 1946 to 1949. So he's also uh, the president of AI. And so this is, the, this is a picture I took from this memorial written by Frank Austin and published in 1990 by uh, National Academy of Science and which summarized the major contributions of Manfred in the complement field. It basically, it's very, very elegant that he presented one hit model of this interaction. So uh, he broke the reaction down into sequential events and the initial purified the complement and being analysis. This basically will permit the measurement of the complement component in a molecular term. This is way back to gene has been cloned. So therefore, this is very important for the sequential, the analysis of complement signaling. So in my opinion, as a biochemist, so I also view this as a very great model to influence apoptosis study because apoptosis, the program cell death is a similar way as a program as a sequential protease activation and the sequential events. Another big contribution in this memorial is also mentioned that uh, Dr. Mayer turned his attention to the mechanism why this sequential reacting protein will produce hole in the membrane, as I just show you guys by electron microscope. So, and pay attention to the nomenclature at that time is still called C3. Now we call that C5B and 9 to 9. So, his analysis basically show that this form as a pentamolecular complex, which is now being known as C59, which form this transport com complex. So basically, this gentleman provides a very, very detailed biochemical knowledge about the complement into these pathways that are leading to this activation. So then, very interesting, they're talking about this at the, immune, at the innate immunity. And then people say complement is a very old molecular. Through evolution, it exists, must have innate immunity function. But however, the evidence for its function in innate immunity, it's very limited. So people found very, very few. Even the poor complex I just mentioned, I just illustrated, they can only show by certain arbitrary biomembrane. So basically people don't know what is the pathophysiological relevance of this ball complex formation in the innate immunity. And, and also another thing you guys should pay attention is since the discovery of the complement, which is during the host immune fighting with the pathogen. So after that, all the complement studies will be predominant by the complement in the serum, will be dominant by the study complement intact with the pathogen, because we know that this defense, how this can directly kill pathogens is very important. So therefore, even the later discovered altern alternative pathway, lactin pathway, they only mention these two different pathway, is not dependent on antibody but they are still dealing with pathogen directly because the rationale for that is you might have some um, 
components on the pathogen that's can directly recognize by complement, additional complement protein, not necessary through antibody. So this is all dominant by, by uh, pathogen. So over 100 people have no turn a look at uh, the commensal. So here we illustrate this as Lantus B3 is a, is a commensal. So therefore, they can physically form this big pore complex. And then it, because they are dealing different, this is a commensal. So, and so they may not necessarily need to immunize specific antibody to recognize this. And then think about the time that this is when the gut commensal microbiota just been inoculated, starting to be established. This is way more important events for the host to distinguish self and the non-self. So therefore, I think that per se could also be leading to the innate immunity uh, a conception. So, and the other thing is this bacterial is colonizing mice and in human on the early from the first day. So it's very important to uh, dealing and control this. So therefore, following uh, Dr. Mayer's step, that we think that we provide here, that's a C1 dependent, antibody independent, but a passenger independent microbiota dependent pathway could be have highly relevant. So especially during the early day of the microbiota established. So um, this not only just have fundamental immunology, knowledge, uh, interest, but uh, to me, it's also uh, very important to think about. They have a lot of things and that we can think about as a human being. So um, especially how to establish a healthy gut microbiota during early life is very important. So um, the baby mousing is, is, is very frequently, as you see, because from the beginning of days, they're using their mouse to basically learn and recognize the whole world. They're putting almost everything in their mouse. So from microbiota's back, we'll say, okay, this is good because in this way, not super hygiene will, will be increased in inoculation of different bacterial species will be helpful their diversity of the microbiota and so on and so forth. So I know that will be normal for in the physiology, but always you will worry, where's the boundary? How do you know which one is good and which one is bad? So we'll be always worried, so how about dirty stuff goes there? So now, if we understand by evolution, complement protein exists in breast milk in mammals for years, and they, they didn't been, uh, get rid of that, so they must be play very, very important uh, uh, functions there. So the strain as we identified, the staphylococcus uh, B3, which is one of the strains which colonize within the first day and the first week. So it's very important for the host to control the, the abundance of that. So uh, therefore, we think a complement uh, in the breast milk will have this capability, basically selectively eliminate a certain type of bacteria. Therefore, the function is shaping the offspring's evolving gut commensal microbiota. So this commensal microbiota is very important because more and more we realize they have a lot of things was coming from developmental origin. So the early life microbiota seeding, how quick and how stable the established microbiota is very evolving and dynamic, and which could be have a very, very important far reaching impact for the later life, what is healthy or disease. So here just give you one illust illustration that people have uh, sequencing the microbiota in the infants from newborn four days and the four months, 12 months, and also compare those with their mom. So you can see very, very evolving and dynamic and uh, for different micro species, uh, different micro species to establish and to basically uh, functionally um, to establish as a, as a healthy microbiota. 
So therefore, now we know in this magic job, you have uh, so many different micro uh, bioactive and additional components, which is through evolution is, is, exists in the, in the breast milk, must have a very important function. So how does it impact the microbiota establishment, and which is known is very important for the immune education and the later disease and so on and so forth. So we know during the early life, the parents are very, very joy about the new, uh, the new members of the family. They pay more attention with the development, they pay more attention with additional things, but for the microbiota, definitely that's very, very important. So um, this has already received increasing attention and has been viewed as developmental origins of health and the disease. So therefore, better understand, complement components as well as other components in the breast milk. It's very important for uh, the general uh, public health. So therefore, we think that is a very it fits nicely well with the school's view: protect lives, protect health, protecting health, saving lives, millions at a time early in life. <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention. Well, that's uh, terrific, Ben Yi. Thank you so very much. I, I wish I could say I understood every bit of it, but um, I certainly understand the implications and you are protecting health, saving lives millions at a time early in life. That's, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, questions, yes. Great talk, Feng Yi. I want to ask, is it possible to make complements protein and then put in formula milk to help those who cannot be breastfed? Yeah, so that's a great idea. I assume must have some colleagues will jump in this field as well. But uh, definitely you can do that. But uh, how to maintain its bioactive, that could be a great issue, not only just amount, but also the activity. So now we just... Basically, our study only illustrates the importance and the significance of complementing in the breast milk. Clearly, when we know more about this, then we'll guide the additional way that's do more translation of definitely this should be, should be doable, yeah. Can we file a patent on that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, hi, Dr. Wan. Thank you so much for this wonderful and very informative lecture. Um, my question is about for humans, we know the uh, exclusive breastfeeding or not, or the lens of exclusive breastfeeding have a huge impact on the children's health and their later health outcomes. So I was wondering if there's any similar research, uh, like your research is exploring the health effects of breastfeeding. If there's such research focused on the health impacts of exclusive breastfeeding have different impacts on later health outcomes uh, related to your com yeah. complementary protein. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely they yeah. have. Definitely they have a com uh, current uh, um, epi study on that direction. So um, the FDA is highly suggest the breastfeeding because it's a natural. Um, um, natural uh, nutrients for not only development but also for immune system. So the difference over the time, the breast milk contents change. So this is also very very important. And uh, the breastfeeding basically well shift the different microbiota. So exclusive breast breastfeeding and if you include the formula or supplementary, that will be dramatic. They have a dramatic difference impact on the. Uh, children's gut microbiota, which has been known. That's um, C cell breastfeeding, antibiotic treatment, as well as additional in advance with solid food could also change the bacterial culture leading to different microbiota establishments. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Sure. So beyond early life, um, given that uh, microbiota, it's increasingly recognized as important for even for adults. So now, do you recommend everyone, including adults, to, to drink milk now? 
<laughs> I'm using data to answer that, okay. So um, this is adult microbiota, and this is a baby's microbiota. So their composition is dramatically different. I would say adults drink milk will only provide, in my opinion, will be only provide a new chain advantage. May or may not provide uh, immunology, the protection advantage that we, I just mentioned, because their microbiota is already different. And the breast milk need to deal in this is the early days, because they have a different microbiota, different species exist on the early life. So after change the solid food and the microbiota composition already changed. So therefore, the breast milk by nature should be only or best dealing with the microbiota during that time. So that's my personal guess. Yeah, just to look at the B3 we identified. This species is only exist um, at the beginning of the early life, but later. So if you can, if you want to see, so you see this blue line, right? So the line underneath is a stuff. So you can see it's very highly elevated during newborn, but then after four months, 12 months, and adults, it's totally gone away. So therefore, by nature, they should be only due in certain species during certain phase. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So um, okay. my name is Parul Christian. I'm in the Department of International Health where we do work in maternal status, nutrient status, uh, breast milk composition, and infant growth development and survival. And so this work is uh, really you know, very interesting. And um, you know, we have published papers on the entire immune system that exists in human milk. And I had not paid attention to the complement system in, in the review that we did. And so this is exciting work. Um, so congratulations, and like I wrote to you, we, we should talk a little bit more because we have human milk um, archives in our, in our freezers where we've uh, looked at uh, supplementation interventions and its impact on breast milk composition. Yes, thank you so much. I hope this will be a great compliment to your study. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I just wanted to ask you a, a quick question about like how, uh, what is the trajectory of the infant's uh, own complement system in its development? Because we know that infants are born with an immature immune system. And when does it kick in? And, and you know, its dependency on milk, of course, is... Um, early in life, and then how does it develop its own system? Uh, and um, also related question is, there's so many other components that influences gut microbiota and the entire immune system of the infant and protects it against a whole range of pathogens. How, where is, uh, how does com the complement system fit within that entire uh, kind of um, system. <laughs> okay, so I'll answer the second question first. Uh, that's easier. And so clearly all the components in breast milk should collectively pay work together to control the microbiota. And even in the breast milk, they also have bacteria as well. So we did 16S sequencing, they have a bacterial. And so antibody will target a certain type complement by targeting a different type. So I would say collectively. And um, without phenotype, it will be difficult to distinguish which one is important for certain type and so on and so forth. So that's, and also uh, microbiota is very dynamic. So that's what makes it difficult. But uh, I will view that's, uh, my personal opinion will be all the components in the breast milk being very, very important. And how many being, so this we identified as Atlantis B3 by just by very simple, anaerobic culture, so we are lucky. So, but I didn't view that this would be the only species that would be controlled by complement. There could be additional also being controlled as well. So that's, we need a further exp experiments to include that. Then in terms of the complement development in, in, the, in the pups, that's to be honest, I don't know that much. As I think Al will answer, have a better answer for that question. But then based on the, our data, because um, even we using wild type pups in the cross-force experiments, 
either the complement system is not developed during the 21 days or is not is indispensable for challenging with the, with, with the host. So my personal guess will be the complement may not develop because complement, most of the complement will be sensitive in the liver, in the adulthood. So during these 21 days, so, um, so uh, I think if, if I'm talking about this in parallel, could be answer your question. 21 days, even the stomach is not differentiated. So they didn't generate the pH during 21 days. They just like a big storage for milk. And uh, the whole thing during 21 days for mice is sleep, eat, and poop. So basically for development. So therefore, if you imagine stomach need to be further differentiated after win, then I think it would be a reasonable reason to guess that the liver should be further differentiated after that. So, and so once you change, like to solid food, the stomach starting to be further differentiated to put in pH there, and then everything starting to microbiota is different, energy is different, so, solid food is different, everything has been had different phase for development. So I guess the complement system, major complement system senses in the liver will be, will be during that phase. But I think that's where the mice model and the human model would be very different because the postnatal development is, is uh, very different in both in those two. Oh, okay. Looks like there's a collaboration beginning here. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, I think we have time for one more question, and it's from Ethan um, online. So, Ethan, if you could just unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, can you hear me okay? There he goes. Hi, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Wang. That was very uh, fascinating work. I have two questions, actually. So the um, the first one was uh, whether you looked uh, or found any differences in the milk microbiome of the dams, the wild type versus C1 versus C3 knockout uh, mice. And the second question is um, just to pick your brain a little bit, if you're aware of any literature on how uh, the fucosyl transfers two or three um, status or phenotypes of the dams or pups affect uh, complement activity in milk. Okay, thank you so much, Ethan. So it sounds like you're one of the reviewers of our paper. <laughs> so we get, we get, we get, we get exactly uh, the same questions uh, from the reviewers uh, as well as the, the one I just answered you. He said, uh, okay, this, where, where, where did this like a complement to kill bacteria in vivo in the mice? Is in the mouth, is in the mouse, in the, in, in the mouse or in the stomach or is in the colon? And then if it's in the colon, then how this complement protein can go through the stomach? So they just answer the question. At the beginning, the stomach is not differentiated, so everything can go there. So uh, we do measure the microbiota in the breast milk because the nipple has an open, so they expose to the environmental, so they have a microbiota there. And we do see on uh, the small intestine, we can see uh, the colon. We try to do the, uh, the, uh, the oral microbiome, but because the mice is so tiny, it's difficult to get enough material. So complement difference, their breast milk my, uh, microbiota is different as well. So this is for sure. And then at breast milk, the complement deficient, the Aslantus level is not a high, it's even lower. So Y type have even, Y type dams, in the breast milk, they have an even higher staphyl level. But then after they go to the pops, their level dramatically reduced. And the complement dams is reversed. In the breast milk, they have a relatively low level of staph. But then in the pops gut, they starting to dramatically increase. So therefore, you can imagine the pops gut and dams nipple a breast is different microenvironment. So bacterial culture and the growth levels could be different. So therefore, therefore we think um, from where these complements in the breast milk can kill Aslantus, we think they're starting from the mouth and then go through the whole GI tract 
and from from the small intestine, from the from the stomach, from the small intestine, and from the the colon. Great. Well, thank you so much, Fenyi. That was a, a brilliant presentation, brilliant science, and I think. Um, given the news today that we, again, were ranked number one as a school of public health, this is one of the reasons um, why we are ranked um, as a top school of public health. Um, the science and doing and taking the science and applying it to um, real life and saving, saving lives. And you're, you're doing uh, wonderful, wonderful work. So thank you so much. And um, please join us um, at the gallery um, for some refreshments. Sorry for those of you online, can't make it, but uh, uh, we'll have you there in spirit. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for your attention.